on for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction, presents... X minus one... Night story, Dr. Grimshaw's Sanitarium. What you will hear in the next half hour represents either a magnificent hoax or the true explanation of the famous Grimshaw Sanitarium scandal which made the headlines back in 1947. The manuscript upon which this account is based was removed by the New York State Police from a fountain pen cover found in the doorway to Dr. Grimshaw's study. We offer this manuscript as evidence only. Whether it is authentic or not, you must judge for yourselves. My name is John Dougherty. I'm a graduate of Hamilton College, class of 34, a member of Theta Alpha. I'm one of those fools who wanted some excitement in life, so instead of going into my father's shoe business, I became a private detective. These are facts. You can check them if you like. The rest of what I write here is so fantastic that I don't expect it to be believed. If anyone should find this manuscript and read it, all I ask is that you notify Miss Millicent Armbruster of 299 Wallace Avenue, Buffalo, that Johnny Dougherty is dead. On the evening of July 1st, Miss Armbruster and I were driving to a wedding. Not our own, although I wish it had been. It was Sunday. And in order to avoid traffic, I took the old mill road. A single-lane dirt affair that runs past the Gowanda Cemetery. Johnny, aren't you going too fast? Not for this road. There isn't a thing around except some tombstones and... Johnny, the, the gate to the cemetery. Well, what about it? That hearse, look out! Look out! <laughs> We skidded for about 20 feet and slammed into the back of the hearse. The two rear doors buckled and snapped open. It was a freak. A huge oak coffin with brass handles tipped up and began slowly to slide back toward us. Oh, how horrible. You stay right here, baby. You okay, Mac? You don't pay much attention to speed limits, do you, Jack? Now, look, let's not get hung up on who was right and who was wrong. I was going too fast and you were traveling without lights after dark. Let's see your driver's license. All right, here. Oh. Private eye, eh? Now, if you don't mind, who does this joy wagon belong to? Go on to funeral service. It's being rented to Grimshaw. Who? Grimshaw from the private sanitarium. Mind if I ask what you were doing after dark coming out of a cemetery with a wooden kimono? We're moving one of Grimshaw's patients to a new grave. They always travel like this? Look, Hawkshaw, how about skipping the third degree and giving me a hand getting this box back in the wagon? A pleasure. Better screw on that cover again. It's going to slide off. Let's get it in the hearse first. Okay, Junior, you get on that end. Okay. You ready? Yeah, lift. Uh, just slide it. Oh, brother, who's in there, King Kong? Look out for the cover. Uh, I told you that would happen. The guy's name, Junior. Oh, why don't you ask him, Sherlock Holmes? A real wise guy, huh? I've got half a mind to report this accident. Yeah, well, go ahead. See where it gets you. Now, if you'll pardon me, I'll deliver the body. Everything all right, Johnny? Yeah, I thought so until a few seconds ago. Listen, Millie, can you sit here in the car for another five minutes? 
Where are you going? For a stroll through the cemetery. Oh, Johnny, stop making jokes. When we lifted that coffin back on the meat wagon, I got a good look inside it. Ooh. Yeah, exactly how I felt. I figured we'd knock the stuffing out of the corpse, only I didn't expect the stuffing to be sand. What? Yes. That wasn't a body, that was a dummy stuffed with sand, a dummy with a wax face. Johnny! Which brings up an interesting question. Who's supposed to be in that box, and, uh, just where is the dead man spending his time? <laughs> Sometimes in my business, when things drop off, you have to go out and, uh, well, dig up new clients. My next case was a gentleman named Harlan Ward Sr., a wealthy automobile manufacturer. I'd gotten his name off his son's tombstone. Are you trying to tell me, Dorothy, that my son Harlan was never buried at Gowana Cemetery? Exactly, Mr. Ward. But why? Maybe if you'll tell me the circumstances surrounding your son's death, I can help answer that. My son was a rather impetuous young man. Tall, good-looking. After his graduation from Princeton, he began drinking quite heavily. After he got into a couple of scrapes, we sent him to Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium in the hopes that he could be cured. While my wife and I were in Europe, we received word that he died. Buried at Guana in our absence. Last week, my wife and I decided to have his body removed to the family vault here at Short Hills. How'd your son die? Suicide. You never saw the body? No. We couldn't get back from Europe in time. Now you tell me that his coffin contains a dummy. How do I know this whole thing isn't a plan to fleece me? You don't. But you're a rich man, Mr. Ward, and you're perfectly willing to take a chance that I'm on the level... And that your son may still be alive. You sound very sure of yourself, Mr. Dalton. My fee is a $2,000 retainer plus expenses. What sort of expenses? However much it costs to take the cure at Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium. Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium was just outside Gowanda. Most of the cases were nervous breakdowns and alcoholics. I committed myself as a dipso, and just to make it convincing, I stopped at five or six bars on the way over. I was interviewed by Grimshaw himself, a small man with a fringe of white hair. You understand, Mr. Dorothy. That's not my real name, of course, social reasons. We understand. Our paid clientele is very select, and our rates are very high. You will be paid in cash and in advance, Dr. Grimshaw. How long does a cure usually take? Uh, that, of course, depends on the degree of alcoholism. Uh, this is my assistant, Dr. Boyna. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, we are accepting Mr. Dorothy as a patient. Better place him in the ward with Mr. K and Mr. Kreiki. Uh, Mr. K is a long-term patient, Mr. Dorothy. A highly intelligent man, formerly a professor of plant pathology. Uh, Mr. Kreiki uh, suffers mild delusions. I think you'll find him rather amusing. <laughs> After about three days, my roommates Arthur Kay and Crakey got used to me. And we even began to play three-handed bridge. Kay was a chronic dope addict, an intelligent, sensitive man. Crakey was nothing but a clown. He kept a big black cat named the Professor, which he talked to as if it were human. And so I said to her, my dear Countess, if you don't like the company of my cat, then you don't like me. She looked at me as if I were insane. But, of course, the joke was on her because I was. Eh, Professor? Meow. The Professor is very sociable. Excellent company. Except when he kills birds and deposits them in your bed. He's nothing but a feline murderer as far as I'm concerned. Ah, see? You have insulted him, Mr. K. Come here, Professor. Let's make friends. How about giving me your paw? Uh oh Scratched me, you black devil. You insulted him. You hurt his feelings. Well, just keep him away from me. It will be a pleasure. I would advise you not to insult him again. Good afternoon and evening. Is he always as nuts as that? Ever since I've been here. What's his problem? Manic depressive. And a little paranoid, too. How long have you been here, Arthur? At Grimshaw's? Two years. I left for a while, but I couldn't stay away from the junk, so I committed myself again. Did you uh, happen to know a patient here named Harlan Ward? Why do you ask that? Did you know him? No, I met him socially a few times. 
understand he died here. So the newspapers said I wouldn't know. Suicide, wasn't it? Was it? You're being pretty careful, aren't you? Mr. Doherty, what would you say if I were to tell you that I don't believe Harlan Ward is dead? What makes you so certain? He used to share this room with us. He slept in the same bed you now use. I see. He was an alcoholic, doing quite well, too. From what I could observe, we all expected him to go home soon. Then one evening, he had a violent fight with Crakey. Crakey accused him of snooping or something. Later that night, Grimshaw and Voyner took him out. Where? Where they take all the special treatment cases to the charity clinic. It's that small building on the other side of the stone wall. A few days later, we read about his death. Suicide, they said. Just what makes you think he's still alive, Arthur? This... About a month ago, I was in the garden next to the wall that separates us from the charity clinic. Suddenly, I thought I heard a sound, like a child whimpering. It stopped. And a moment later, this note came over the wall, wrapped around a stone. What's it say? Help me, for God's sake, Harlan Ward. Arthur, how would you like to have some fun? Like what? Like sneaking out tonight and going over the wall to the charity ward? What do you say? It would break the monotony a little. I suppose there's no real harm in it. Of course not. I'd go alone, but I'll need help scaling the wall. Will you do it? All right. I'll go with you. Up. All clear. Give me a hand and I'll lift you. Yeah. Uh. Careful when you drop. Ready? Go ahead. There's a charity building over there. The one with the lights in the basement window. Come on. Let's crawl over. Maybe we can see something. Shh. Listen. Can you make out what he's saying? No, I can barely hear. Good Lord. What was that? Probably some patient having the DTs. Let's have a look. Easy it wouldn't do to get caught now. See anything? Uh, some sort of laboratory. I can see Grimshaw and Voin and something else. But there's a child with its back toward me. I'll take it quietly. It will be easier. Please, don't. It will all be over soon. You won't remember anything. No, I don't want to go. Why not give it to him? No, no. Shut him up, boy, now. Good Lord, what was it? What did they do to that child? Arthur, that wasn't a child. It was a midget, the smallest midget I've ever seen. What were they doing? Trying to give it some sort of injection. When it resisted, Boyna knocked it out. What do you suppose they were doing to it? I don't know, Arthur. All I know is that when it fell, it had the face of Harlan Ward. <laughs> All the way back to our room, my brain was working like some frantic pinball machine. Only the score somehow wouldn't add up. The pieces were there, all right. A crazy old doctor, a brutal assistant, a private sanitarium, and a midget with a dead man's face. I thought that when I got back to our room, I'd have some time to think about it. I'd forgotten about our friend, the happiness boy, Count Crakey. Meow. Ah. Meow. Oh. Caught you. Fine, you've caught us. Now, how about crawling back into the woodwork like a good little count? Where were you? Mink hunting. Arthur and I like to go mink hunting at night. You make fun of Count Crickey? I shall report you to Dr. Voyner. You'd better not if you know what's good for you. So, you threaten me. Me, Count Crickey. I shall scream for help. Help! Help! Did you hurt him? Just knocked him out. What do we do now? Put him to bed. Hope that when he wakes up in the morning, he's forgotten the whole thing. And if he hasn't? He's too crazy for them to take seriously anyway. Come on, let's get him back into bed. I went to sleep in my own room. 
And the next thing I felt was the sharp jab of the hypodermic needle in my left arm. Hold it. It will be useless to struggle, Mr. Dorothy. In a moment, your motor nerves will be completely paralyzed. What's this about, Grimshaw? I might ask the same of you. My good friend, Count Crakey, informs me you and Mr. K decided to do some snooping earlier tonight. He followed you and saw you climb the wall. Crakey's insane. Mr. Doherty, that is a matter of opinion. Crakey, what is this? Perhaps my assistant, Dr. Grimshaw, would be good enough to explain. Assistant? Yes. You see, I am the actual head of the Grimshaw Sanatorium. Count Crakey feigns many delusions, Mr. Doherty. But in this case, he is telling the truth. Count Crakey is actually Professor Ernst Hassler. Professor Hassler and I worked together in the Berlin Neurological Institute before and during the last war. Unfortunately, my political affiliations with the Third Reich were under investigation by the War Crimes Commission. However, Dr. Grimshaw managed to smuggle me into this country where I masqueraded as a mental patient in order that we might continue certain experiments which were interrupted by the American army. I can imagine the sort of experiments you conducted. You and your friend Mr. K will discover their exact nature very shortly, Mr. Dorothy. It is a magnificent opportunity to serve science. I passed out. And the next thing I knew, I was coming to in a different room. And hearing the voices of Voina, Grimshaw, and Crakey... As if from a great distance. The two are trained. The two are trained. Four cc's. Four cc's. How are the measurements? Reducing rapidly. We'll operate at once. Have Boyner start the anesthesia. Very well, Doctor. Come back. Blinding headache. I began to wonder if Crakey and Grimshaw weren't doing something to drive me insane. Because I lost all sense of perspective. The room seemed to grow in size. I don't know how much time passed, but... One day, Crakey came into the room with a bundle in his arms about the size of a newborn baby. The bundle was my friend, Arthur Kay. And worse yet, I was exactly the same size that he was. Let me out of here. Let me out. Allow me to congratulate you, gentlemen. How are you feeling? You dirty monster. I'm disappointed, gentlemen. Do you not feel privileged to be a part of an experiment that will place me at the very top rank of the world's endocrinologists? What are you doing to us, you madman? It has long been established, gentlemen, that dwarfism and giantism result from injury to or malfunction of the pituitary and thyroid glands. The interlock between these glands was thought to be a hormone. I have discovered that this was incorrect. It was an enzyme. An enzyme I isolated some years ago. I was well on the way to synthesis in Germany when the surrender interrupted me. The interruption also limited the number and type of subjects on whom I could experiment. I was forced to find others. Such as Harlan Ward? Mr. Ward was only a control experiment. I suppose you plan the same for us. No, gentlemen. For you, I have reserved a special privilege. You gentlemen will be the first to test the full effects of the enzyme. In short, I intend that you, Mr. K, and you, Mr. Doherty, when the experiment is completed, will emerge as perfectly healthy, normal individuals. Except, of course, that you will be only five inches tall. The days and nights that followed were a living nightmare. A nightmare from which Arthur and I awoke for brief periods to find ourselves in a strange new world. A huge, frightening world where everything seemed enlarged a hundred times. When we finally emerged, we found ourselves imprisoned in a tiny mouse cage. Judging by the relative size of things, we could not have been more than five inches tall. Now we realized the experiment was at an end. That from now on, It was either escape or be destroyed. How's it coming, Arthur? Another moment. I think I'll have this lock worth loose. And if we escape, then what? We'll worry about that after we get out of this mouse cage. 
Suppose we don't make it. At least you've written the story on that scrap of paper. Someone may find it and read it. Nobody will believe it. Then why did you bother to write it? I don't know. I suppose I want the world to know what happened to me. That does it. Help me push the door open. Now what? The first job is getting down to the floor. I think we can make it by sliding down the telephone cord. Are you game? Go ahead. I'm right behind you. Easy now. Look out! That does it. Now, if we can figure out a way to get out of the room, well, that should be... Uh-oh. Listen. Somebody's coming. It must be Quakey. We've got to hide. Here. The great in the fireplace. He'll kill us if he finds us. Be quiet. Well, my friends. Time for feeding. I trust that you will... So... You have managed to break out. It won't do, you know. There is no way you could have gotten out of the room with the door and window locked. I know you are in here. I would advise you to save yourselves trouble and give up. Very well, my tiny friends. If you prefer to play the game of cat and mouse, then I shall be happy to furnish the cat. There is no way you can get out. What now? He's gone for the cat. If that monster ever gets in here, we're goners. There must be... Wait a minute. What? You see that thin strand of wire running along the molding? What about it? It's the automatic fire alarm. When the alarm is tripped by a fire or short circuit, all the locks are sprung so that the patients can escape from their rooms. If I can short that wire before Craigie lets the cat into the building, let's go. There's a tiny sliver of steel from the cage on the floor. I'll work with that. You keep an ear to the door. Go ahead. This insulation is tough as rawhide. Gosh, this stuff. Hurry up, Arthur, for God's sake. There it is. Stand away. I'm going to short it. Ready? Okay. We made it. There goes the door. Let's make a run for it down the hall. If we can get to the garden, we've got a chance. I smell smoke. The short may have actually started the fire. Come on. Wait a minute. I have to go back. The manuscript. Don't be a fool. There's no time. Come on. You go ahead. I'll catch up. Hurry up. I'll wait in the hall. Only a second. I've got it. Come on. There's nothing to stop us now. Arthur? Where are you? Funny. Arthur? Arthur? Arthur, what's happened to you? This is the record found in a fountain pen cover in the burned-out hallway of Dr. Grimshaw's sanitarium. There's nothing to add, except that the fire which destroyed the sanitarium and killed so many of its occupants, including Dr. Grimshaw and Dr. Voina, was definitely of incendiary nature. It is believed by the fire chief that some small creature, possibly a mouse, chewed the insulation off the wire and short-circuited the system. The two patients, John Doherty and Arthur Kay, vanished completely after the fire, and their remains were never found. Whether the manuscript which you have just heard is authentic, or whether it was the work of one of the more demented inmates of the sanitarium, we leave to your judgment. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Street and Smith, publishers of astounding science fiction. Tonight's story by transcription was Dr. Grimshaw's Sanitarium, a tale of science fiction written by Fletcher Pratt and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Bill Lipton as Doherty, Rosemary Prinz as Millicent, Leon Janney as Mac, Arthur Maitland as Mr. Ward, Ted Osborne as Grimshaw, Peter Capel as Crakey, Roger DeCoven as Kay, and Frank Milano as the Cat. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. And now, next week, Nightmare, The Revolt of the Machines by Stephen Vincent Benet. You'll hear it at X. 
Minus one. Convicts tell their true stories on The Loser tonight over most NBC radio stations.